welcome everybody as you filter into today's episode of Luncheon with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. Hello, my name is Rain Ben, and I will be your host. I've been working with CCF for about 10 years now to create video content that spreads awareness about NETs and education to the, uh, to the NET community. And I wanted to make a quick announcement. When I first started working with CCF, um, we created a video called the ABCs of neuroendocrine tumors. And that was, uh, I think, about 2011. And that was on our YouTube channel for this whole time. It got lots of views, but it was desperately in need of an update, which we have now. And we just released two weeks ago. So it's here on the Facebook page. If you go to videos, it's called ABCs of Neuroendocrine Tumors 2020 Update. It's also on the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation's YouTube channel. So there's a lot of great information uh, in that video. And that's part of another video series that we are bringing out, which today's guest happens to be a part of as well. So we want to thank Lexicon Pharmaceuticals for making this uh, Luncheon with the Experts possible. There's no way that we could do this without their support. And a quick note from them. The opinions that are expressed today by the guest presenter, as well as the questions asked by the audience that you all at home welcome, they have not been created or suggested by the sponsors of the Facebook Live program. And CCF does not endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in this presentation. And audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest presenter and should seek guidance. This is the main point, the main takeaway, should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health and treatments. So today, my guest is Dr. Eric Mitra. How are you, Dr. Mitra? I'm great, Rain, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us. You are on the West Coast, so this is, this, is this the first thing you're doing today? No, actually, I've been up for several been hours. Up for hours. <laughs> yeah, these are the doctors of neuroendocrine tumors and cancer. This is uh, this is how they work, folks. So, uh, for the folks at home, tell us a little bit about your your background. What do you do? Where do you work? Uh, how do you support the neuroendocrine cancer uh, community? Sure. Yeah. First, uh, I just want to thank the CCF for inviting me to uh, join this uh, presentation. I think this is a great opportunity. And thanks to everyone at home for uh, tuning in as well. Um, and and lastly, thanks to you, Rain, for um, for organizing everything. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, so my background, uh, for those who don't know, I'm a nuclear medicine physician. I work at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Prior to that, I was for many years at Stanford University, where I actually did uh, most of my training and uh, stayed on as faculty for several years, and then moved here recently, relatively recently, to uh, lead the program here. I've been involved in the NET community for quite a number of years. Um, I think as many people are in this community, they, they've, we've sort of gotten interested over time, and uh, that definitely happened to me as well. I, uh, and so through various different clinical trials and other projects, uh, that's how I started. And it's really just a uh, really an, uh, amazing community, I think. And the more I've been able to uh, participate in, in patient-oriented uh, events, it's been really quite satisfying. So uh, thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. We're happy to have you. And so if you're just signing on, audience members, that's you at home, let us know where you're signing on from in the world. We'd love to see this reach. And I already see some of you all doing that. So hello back to you. Send Dr. Mitra a hello. I wanted to give you a little bit of information about what we're trying to accomplish because we've, we've been doing Facebook Lives for about a year now in a, in a different way, a different program. And now we have this weekly talk show, if you will, Luncheon with the Experts. And the, and the goal of this is is to really you know one of our videos or several of our videos the people I've, I've talked to and i've witnessed this from working with the the net community for for a decade now that word community is such a big part of it and 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 i don't know that i've seen the camaraderie in the community uh, around any other diseases that i've i've done uh, films for I just that's something that's so apparent so palpable with the people in this community and so our goal with this series is to have a moment a one-on-one -on -one, you know an hour luncheon with experts and members of the community so that we can dive a little bit deeper into what makes those people tick and what makes them who they are what attracted them to the work that they do it won't just be doctors it'll be doctors nurses patients caregivers uh, support group leaders all the members of the neuroendocrine cancer community and so 
um, we're going to just have a conversation and a deep dive into these individuals who make up the community. And so I urge you, send your questions. Um, obviously, most of the guests will have certain areas of expertise. Um, but I would say that no questions are, are really uh, off topic. Dr. Amitra has promised that he will try to address anything you ask. Um, so yeah, feel free to send your questions as we go through the Facebook Live. We really appreciate you all joining us. And if we can't get to your questions or you have uh, further questions after we have answered some, I always urge you to reach out and message the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation either here on their Facebook page, you can just send them a private message, or at carcinoid.org. And lastly, I just want to say that we know how challenging it is to be a net patient or person seeking diagnosis, especially during the pandemic and all the issues that arise from that. We just want to let you know that CCF is here for you. We love creating programs that help you. This is the point of all of it. This is why we do it. And if you'd like to show support and help us continue to do that uh, for CCF and their work, please text experts, that is E-X-P-E-R-T-S, to the number 1-914-380-7323. Again, that is experts to 914-380-7323. You can donate there and show your support in that way. It really helps us continue to provide these valuable programs. We will try to put that in the comments so that you can see those and you don't just have to, to remember what I said. And if Dr. Mitra refers to any um, uh, links or articles or books or things like that resources today we will also try to find that link very fast uh, and put that in the comments section as well so um dr meacher let's go ahead and get into it i i we talked a little bit when we did this test um a few days ago and you know i just mentioned how difficult this is for patients in in this the time of covid19 and coronavirus it's difficult for everybody. I mean, it's a strange new world that we're in, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested and I've talked to, to many doctors, not just with in this capacity for, for CCF, but just in, you know, my personal life. And it's, it's, it's got to be challenging for you all in a major, major way uh, and different. And, and, and I'm really curious to, to learn a little bit about like, how has the pandemic impacted you, your life uh, and, and your work? Yeah, of course, absolutely. It's such a such challenging time for everyone, um, you know. And I think the biggest thing is that everyone is trying to deal with this in in their own way, which you know I really can't stress enough because um, every area of the country and every institution and every person is obviously very different in what they're dealing with, and especially when you're dealing with um, cancer, both from the the patient side and from the provider side. And I think brings a, another whole level of, of concern and, and care to, to the whole situation. So mm -hmm. pers personally, you know, things uh, here in Oregon have been relatively lucky, I would say. We did a, a great job in, in, in flattening the curve early on. Uh, now, like much of the country, we're, we're seeing a rise in cases. But our, our hospital at, at OHSU... Um, you know, really went to a lot of precautions early on, and we've had not had a huge rise of cases so far. Having said that, we've done, you know, everything that we can do in our clinic and in nuclear medicine, as well as the rest of the university to try to limit the uh, risk to all patients. And so we've moved a lot of our um, visits to virtual, of course. Um, as far as the treatments go for PRT, um, we've definitely tried to manage that as best that we can. What I mean by that is that we don't want to delay the treatment for those that you know truly need it, but at the same time we uh, you know are mindful that it, perhaps if things are relatively stable, for instance, then we might might delay the treatment a little bit or or be especially cautious of how we do it. Because PRRT treatments are in a cycle, right? So would you just like right. lengthen lengthen the term in between treatments? Is that what I hear you saying? Potentially, the biggest thing that we actually did, right, so it's given us four cycles of therapy once every two months, typically. Uh, so what we, uh, the biggest thing that we did was we, for instance, didn't start the treatment by a couple of months during the peak of the pandemic. Um, and again, that might happen again, if that's the situation, but it, but equally for other patients that had more uh, uh, pr quickly progressing disease than we did go ahead and start the treatment. But for those that were already on the treatment, for the most part, we maintain that the, the cycle because our feeling is that if you delay it too much in between, a slight changes are okay, but if you delay it too much, then it might 
reduce the, the end result. Sure, sure. Let's put a pin in that because I'm sure that we will come back to PRRT. That is a topic that people always want to, to know about. And I know that you're a specialist uh, in. I'm curious, um, you know, I've done a lot of work with different people and telling the stories of what I call health and happiness. And, and as you know, these different pillars of health are all overlapping and interconnected. I'm wondering personally, how do you, how do you stay, stay healthy? And I don't just mean like, oh, I, I, I cycle twice a week. That could be part of it. But but this has got this is hard for everybody physically and mentally right now. So, are there practices that you have done or or incorporated that that help you just sustain and 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 keep moving forward on a day to day basis? Yeah, I think the the holistic approach is really the the, the main one that works for me and um, you know what I advocate for patients as well. Um, you know, phys- physically, uh, as you said, you know, exercise is very important. Um, healthy eating is is another thing that that I definitely try to do. I try to stay away from the fridge and snacking as much as I can it's here. So when hard I'm hard when you're at home, home all day long. <laughs> it's, it's very tempting, um, and especially you know, in terms of stressful periods, it becomes especially tempting. But uh, you know, just to try to be mindful of those things, and then and then mentally. Uh, having opportunity to um, take a break uh, both during the day and then at night, you know, as you, as you were pointing out, my day starts early typically and it ends late, but um, there, there has to be some time where you take some time for yourself, both mentally and physically to take a break. And, and of course, sleep is uh, so, so critically important for Crucial. everyone. Crucial. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. I, I found for me personally, a good way to kind of kill you know, two birds with one stone, as they say, is, is, is walks, just walks because, uh, and of course, you know, staying socially distant and if it can be in nature, great, but, um, you know, you can get, get your heart rate up a little bit, get your steps in and get some physical movement, which is crucial. But also like, I'm, I'm someone who sits at a computer screen for a big part of the day, obviously a lot more now. Um, so, so just, just breaking up that monotony and like seeing like, it's seeing trees and also allowing your eyes I listened to a podcast about this recently, uh, allowing your eyes to focus more on the horizon instead of things that are just six to 12 inches from us, right? Our phones or our computer screens. So like that for me has been, been really beneficial. Just simply just getting out and, and taking a little walk. If I can bring my daughter with me. Like now we're getting family quality time. We're killing maybe three birds with one stone. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. No, I think any type of movement, frankly, is is very very useful. I love Doesn't that. matter what what it is. Just get up out of your chair and take a walk, like you said, or 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 something more. Yeah, and we are a little bit lucky now, at least, that the weather is improving in most parts of the country. And so. yeah, I'd say so. In North Carolina, it's improved all the way up to about ninety five degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes those those walks uh, don't quite last as long as they did in April. Uh, mm-hmm. I've got some questions coming in. I'm going to start taking some questions from uh, from the audience. So I'm curious before uh, before we do that, um, where where did you grow up? Are you? I from- grew up in California. Okay, yeah, so I know you're. I know you've been on the West Coast for a while, but you grew up in that area. Yep, I'm a, definitely a West Coast person, uh, but I didn't spend all my life there. I grew up in California. I went to college there. This is in Northern California, um, but then for medical school and my PhD, I was in uh, New York. So that was my uh, period in the Northeast, which I really enjoyed. Actually, it was really nice to to get away. It's my other choice vibe, was, right? <laughs> yeah, very different vibe. My other choice was to go to Southern California for medical school, and uh, I, in a heartbeat, I chose to go to New York. And yeah, totally um, different vibe yeah. down there. Yeah. What? Um, yeah, but having, what, what kind of like what? Uh, what was your thing as a kid? What kind of a kid were you? Uh, I was very. Uh, a, Good kid, I would say. <laughs> I wasn't the uh, type that would really push boundaries uh, so much. Um, well, maybe cute. I've uh, maybe I missed out on some good opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. They're they're you know yeah. they're they're not all they're they're chalked up to be. But did you know like you wanted to be a doctor? Did you know you wanted to go into medicine when you were a young age? I did actually. Yeah, I can't cool. remember a time when I didn't want to do that. It was one of my earliest things, and it's actually. In- a little bit strange because I don't have a lot of doctors in my family. Hmm. Um, Where do you think that came from? I really don't know. I don't know, but it was the perfect, I always loved science and um, it was just the perfect blend of, you know, being able to do that. But I knew I didn't want to just work in a laboratory either. Hmm. Uh, So this is like the perfect, you know, blend of being able to see patients and have direct interaction, which I, 
again, I just value that aspect of my job so much, mm. but then also to be able to contribute in a very uh, real way by bringing the science as well. The, so so I, I can't think of a better job and I've just been so happy and, um, and just thrilled to be able to do what I do and, and provide uh, what I do for patients. When I was a kid, even though I was one of the only kids, I think maybe the only boy that had all A's in school uh, one year, I still told everyone I wanted to be a professional wrestler. So that made my mom, <laughs> my mom really happy. <laughs> She's like, not a doctor, not a lawyer. No, you want to be a pro wrestler. <laughs> that, yeah, I might actually be the only um, Indian person in history whose parents actually dissuaded them to go to medical school. <laughs> what did they uh, want you to do? I don't know. Any, anything... But that, uh, I think they That's were a little fun. bit worried that it was going to be too, too stressful and too time consuming, which it certainly is. But again, I was very, very focused on that. So I didn't look back. So you had mentioned something about like, you kind of have the best of both worlds in, in the work that you're doing now, like not just in a laboratory. What's, what's like a, t what's your typical day to day? Uh, my day to day alternates between being in the clinic um, and then other days which are uh, academic, uh, but and those academic days can vary a lot from um, doing research, doing administrative work here. Uh, since I've moved to OHSU, like I say, a large part of my job is kind of building the, uh, the program here. And so, uh, you know, kind of just doing a variety of different tasks that, that are involved with that. So, yeah, but, uh, but there too, that's, I, I love that mixture of being able to do multiple different things instead of just one thing. When did you, when did it start to veer into nuclear medicine? When did that you know, reveal itself or appear as like, oh, this is the way I want to take things. In medical school, I think uh, pretty much no one is exposed to uh, nuclear medicine early on. In fact, even in medical school, a lot of people aren't exposed to nuclear medicine, which is a real shame because it's such, such a great field. And it's why kind do you of think really, that is? why are they not exposed to it? Like, is it just, because it's just not covered as much? Yeah, it's just uh, essentially a, a niche field that falls sort of in between multiple other fields, such as uh, radiology, uh, oncology, radiation medicine, or radiation oncology. Um, and so it's because it's sort of in between these different fields, it's not one of the main dominant things that medical students are exposed to. I, I do try to go out of my way when I give uh, lectures to medical students to make sure that they know what this field is. And I've gotten actually several several students um, interested in, in pursuing the field because it's, it's, it's a wonderful way to kind of bridge all those different things. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we already kind of touched on PRT and I'm getting a few questions in uh, about that as I, as I expected that we would. Can we talk about that for a moment and, and, est yeah. and establish, and you and I, you know, I, I did an interview with you for the video series back in October, I believe, and we talked about this a lot. Um, and I know that this has been, it's been available since what, January, 2018 in the U S right. And I know a lot of people have had success from it. I know that people are excited about it. Can we establish for those that aren't familiar with it? Like what exactly is it? Why is it effective? Why are people excited about it? Why is it a, a good, uh, a good treatment to pursue? Yeah. So um, PRRT stands for peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, which is a fancy way to say that we are delivering a radiopharmaceutical, so radioactive isotope um, to your cancer cells by using a specific type of target that's expressed on them, which I know that many people are familiar with as uh, somatostatin uh, receptors. Mm -hmm. And so actually the therapy has been used in Europe and other parts of the world for, for many, many decades, uh, almost, uh, over 20 years. But uh, as you said, Rain, it's been approved in the US since January of 2018, which has been uh, great so that people don't have to travel around the world totally. to get this, get this therapy. Now in the US, there are over 150 centers that actually uh, offer PRRT. Awesome. Um, although I will, one warning I will say right off the bat there is that, you know, there are a lot of variability in the centers, I would say. Um, and really as a neuroendocrine patient, it's important to seek out, um, the, those centers that have more experience with a mm -hmm. higher volume of cases and have, you know, a group of, of different experts that can kind of help because, um, one thing I wanted to highlight from your introduction, Rain, was that yeah. this this community, as you said, it's such an important uh, aspect of of the treatment for this thing because not just one person can do can do all of this. So even when it comes to PRT, which I do, 
it really requires the involvement of making sure the surgeon and the interventional radiologist and the radiologist and the pathologist and the primary care physician, everyone is in agreement and wants this oh. you know, for you. So you had mentioned 150 centers now provide PRRT. Basically, um, some maybe we'll say with 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 not as much experience. Is that fair? Right. Like, mm-hmm. How do how do we get that those lines to be a little more consistent? Is it just they offer it longer, or is it to you know how do we how do we raise the levels of some of those that are less experienced with this option? Does I think uh, probably the answer to that again goes back to having uh, uh, the full group of uh, neuroendocrine experts at that at that center. Mm -hmm. So um, that can come in a, come in a variety of different ways because even some of the um, outpatient centers that might offer this uh, may work together with other local centers and and, and together can provide the uh, expertise. But um, on the other hand, the best, best um, options potentially for patients might be to go to one center that offers all of those types of people. And if, and if they do, then they're probably going to start getting more and more experience with doing the doing the PRT because I'll tell you from my perspective as a nuclear medicine physician, it's easy enough to actually administer the therapy. Believe it or not, that's not the most complicated part to it, but it's really making sure that it's the right therapy for you at the right time in the disease process, and you know all the other factors have been really looked at. That's that's what's most mm-hmm. important, not not the actual administration of the isotope. Got it. Got it. So I've got a question from Thomas or probably Tomas Peterson. He says, I have read several reports that the progress of tumors have increased after PRR treatment. How is this possible? Is that possible? All the data that we have does not show that to be the case. Um, again, the, the, the main data that we look at is from the phase three NETR1 trial. Uh, which led to the approval of PRRT. And in that one, most of the patients actually had stable disease, meaning it didn't change uh, on imaging after the therapy was done or during the course of the therapy. A smaller percentage of people, approximately 13%, actually had a slight um, reduction in the size of their tumors. But um, but I would say that if, if, if uh, the tumors are truly growing, after the um, PRT is done, especially within one year, then that would be more or less considered not a good outcome from the PRT. I I, I only say more or less because PRT also can have other benefits, for instance, in terms of symptom control. Um, So you might still see some of those benefits, even if the tumor size itself changes. But ultimately, tumor size change is the most important thing. Got it. Got it. I also have another uh, audience member, Sarah, who said, I had my second round of PRRT and now my pulse is low. Is that, is that from the treatment? Is that a side effect or a symptom? Um, the, that might be a symptom uh, if, if uh, changes in, your blood, in, in her, her blood pressure it was a pre-existing issue prior to the therapy. Um, so if that was the case, and then the PRT, as a result of the PRT, the uh, blood pressure is, is now low, that potentially could be related to that. But there also are many other reasons for that, so it's it's hard to know for sure. Got it, got it. All right, well, we, got, we have uh, a lot of questions coming in, so we're just going to roll right along if that's all right, Doc. Sure, um, absolutely. Yeah, that's what we're here for. Sean says, question regarding imaging. For people who are in areas without net specialists or adequate, adequately knowledgeable radiologists, is it possible to send their nuclear scans to someone to view who has more experience in reading the information or to make recommendations for what would be the next form of imaging to try and better evaluate what's going on? Yeah, so imaging can be a, a complicated uh, topic because there's so many different types of uh, scans that we now have available, and um, even you know interpreting these scans does require a good amount of expertise. Um, a great example of that, for instance, is that typically in radiology, uh, the most recent prior scan is looked at for the for the comparison, whether that's a CT or an MRI scan. Uh, but we know that for neuroendocrine, things often grow very, very slowly over time. And so it's very important to look back on, on m- multiple prior uh, scans going back even years to really have a full understanding of, w- of what the treatment is. 
doing or, or not doing. Um, so to answer your question specifically, that's a, that's, it's a little bit more challenging because typically images aren't just routinely sent to other institutions for evaluation unless there's a, a specific uh, connection with another physician there. So that connection could be established either by yourself to go to uh, another inst institution and nowadays, uh, with virtual visits, uh, as I was mentioning in the in the pandemic era, that can become actually a little bit easier, even if you don't physically uh, are able to go to that to that other site. So that uh, if you are able to establish a relationship that way with a neuroendocrine expert at another facility, then they would be happy to review those images and and make sure everything is okay. The other way might be to advocate um, at your local facility that those images be reviewed um, together with a, an, an expert. Mm -hmm. We always recommend that pretty much um, anyone should try to have at least one time in the course of their um, their, their life or in their disease process to have an evaluation by a neuroendocrine expert um, because it's it's a very unique disease and not everyone has right. has experience with it. So those are would be my suggestions is to make some connection with a facility that does have neuroendocrine experts and in that context they can review your imaging as well and make suggestions. Awesome. Thank you for that. Hope that helps Sean. Um, another question coming in from Karen. Karen says, do you consult with Ludothera patients prior to their treatment cycles? Yes, um, another good question. Um, so we, I, I would say most um, places do do that, uh, but although the specifics of it can vary, some places, and we're actually trying to move to that to this at OHSU our, ourselves, is to have a full consultation prior to any of any of the therapies starting. So in fact, at the time of the referral from the oncologist, um, we will meet with you, again, could be virtually or in person, and go over the goals of the therapy, go over all your prior imaging, and make sure everything is in, in line, and answer all your questions that you might have about the therapy that you're going to undertake. Subsequently, um, we don't currently have that in place as yet, um, and so what we do in place of that is that prior to every cycle that you have done, we'll come and talk with you and uh, do the same thing. It's a little bit more abbreviated probably than the the other consultation, but it serves the same purpose, which is to make sure that all your questions are answered and all our questions are answered and we're on the same page as far as moving forward with the therapy. Got it, got it, thank you. All right, thanks, Karen. And uh, okay, so I have a question that just came in that I, I, I wanted to kind of direct the conversation at some point here anyway. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that Cheryl has asked this. And I believe, uh, Dr. Mitra, you and I have, have uh, talked about this back in October, but Cheryl says, how worried should I be about radiation from frequent CTs? I've had about 40 of, of them uh, over a decade. And, and I know that um, and this is a concern that, that tends to come up in, in people's minds. Yeah, um, in radiology, we certainly don't take uh, radiation lightly. We uh, follow a principle called ALARA, which stands for as low as reasonably achievable. It's an acronym. Mm -hmm. And um, so the idea of, with that is that every time we, we do a scan that has radiation, um, so CTs being a major one, PET scans is another one that leads to radiation. You know, we, we definitely think about that and, and um, don't treat it lightly. Having said that, the information that comes from those scans is also very, very important as well and can really make uh, significant di uh, di um, differences in how the management of your disease goes. And so uh, really, it's a very difficult question to answer just based on that number that you said. Mm -hmm. It really depends on what is, is going on. So I would say the balance lies somewhere in the, in the middle. Um, and if you're, but if you're concerned about the, those types of things, definitely bring, bring that up to your um, local physicians to, to explain to you better. Why is it that, you know, you need the scan and do you really need it now? And how is it going to change things? Um, I would say again, to, to stress that I don't think anyone in medicine has uh, reflexively orders these scans because mm -hmm. we do understand that there's um, cost, there's radiation, um, there's inconvenience. Um, for, to get them done now in, in the in the COVID era means a, a trip to some sort of either inpatient or outpatient uh, imaging facility, which carries you know some amount of risk to it. Sure. So 
just to be cognizant of those things, but at the same time to really recognize that they do provide a huge amount of information. Yeah. Uh, so, so in, in general, it's, uh, you know, if anyone has fears of, of nuclear medicine or radiation, it's, it's, I don't want to say like a necessary evil because it's not necessarily an evil. Right. But it's, you know, when we talked about like, when we talked back in October, um, getting these scans um, is not really something to be concerned about. Is that fair to say? I mean, not, not to not be concerned about it at all, but when the people think that going and getting one, uh, one scan would be problematic, it's, it's generally not when we're trying to solve this bigger issue. Is that fair to say? Right. Yeah. I think putting it in that context is a, is a great way to think about it. That, okay. that there's a, there's a much larger, you know, issue that we're trying to, to address. And once one or two scans is, is not going to have an effect. Also to think about it in the perspective, for instance, as we're talking about PRT, I mean, the amount of radiation that you're going to get um, from that far out, outweighs anything that, that, you know, um, diagnostic scan, whether mm-hmm. it's CT or PET is going to have. And so, and still, that's something that the benefits far outweigh the the potential risk. It seems typically, yeah, 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 yeah. Gotcha, yeah. Gotcha. But, uh, but but I just don't want to uh, overshadow the fact that yeah, if you get too many scans over over a long period of time, it does add up. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, definitely a fair question, Cheryl. I appreciate you asking. I also want to yeah. just send a little shout out to uh, Maria or Maria. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but she's watching from Chicago while getting her gallium sixty eight scan. So sending you love hey, thanks thanks so much for watching okay um okay uh, karen again has a question does your practice perform a lutetium 177 scan following the lutathera uh, tx infusion and if so at one point and i'll have to ask you to like let's clarify some and establish some of those uh some of those terms lutetium 177 and i know we talked about lutathera uh, previously which is the drug in prrt is that correct Right. Yeah. So um, that's a really good, really good question. Um, And yes, Rain, let me clarify a couple of things before I answer that. So there's two different radioisotopes that we use uh, related to this. One is gallium 68, which is what is was just mentioned, and that is uh, for our PET scan. Um, So that is something that only provides radiation that allows us to image what what we're seeing in your body. Now, the other one is lutetium 177. And that radioisotope actually has two different types of uh, radiation that are given off. One is the one that we use for the actual therapy. It causes some DNA damage, and and that's what results in the therapeutic benefit of it. But also it gives off this um, another type of radiation, which we can also use to take pictures Mm. um, called gamma radiation. And uh, so that leads to this possibility of actually taking images um, of of your body after the therapy is done, after, potentially after each cycle, or um, you know after a, maybe some of the cycles, and it's a um, big area of controversy cur- currently, um, meaning that we, there's not been good uh, established uh, protocols whether or not doing those scans immediately after the therapy really helps. To answer. Uh, the specific question at our institution, OHSU, we actually do do that um, after every scan. It's further complicated because there's different ways of, of doing that scan. Some are very straightforward and some are a lot more complicated. Um, and so it um, depends on wh- wh- which way it's done. But uh, I would have to say at this point, there's not a, not a clear consensus. So I would say probably to either way is fine if you're a if you're at an institution that is not doing these scans i don't think you're really missing out on anything major but if you're at an institution that's doing it um you know there's probably you know that's also probably fair as mm-hmm. well i think in the next few years we'll probably uh have a better consensus from the community as as to whether or not that really helps the I, the general idea is that it allows to, us to see that the therapeutic um Radio pharmaceutical went to uh, you know all the sites that we expected to see based on the pre-therapy imaging. So it's a good confirmation that it has gone to all those things, and it's a quick and sort of dirty way to um, evaluate you know how things are going along with each cycle. Gotcha. Thank you. 
All right. Um, I have another question that says, <clears throat> first diagnosis and surgery, it seems like there were very few carcinoid specialists and only a few resources like CCF back when uh, their diagnosis was in 2009. And so the yeah. question is, it seems like there are more specialists and resources now, but still uh, any doctors, or I will probably, they're meaning most doctors don't understand NETS. Are more doctors specializing in NETS or are there just better resources for us? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think both. Um, you know, the, the understanding of NETS is probably in, increasing uh, over time. Um, and so hopefully, more- Hopefully we're helping with that. Absolutely, the CCF is, is a major player with that, and then there's uh, you know multiple other organizations Absolutely. as well that are that are doing good work in terms of getting the the word out about it. And as a result of that, more physicians I think are beginning to know about it and and learn about it, and the and the resources that are available on the net are uh, on the internet about nets is also um, growing as well. So there's for for physicians who may not have direct access at their institution. There's a lot of um, access that's available online. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, uh, educational resources that are being proactively um, organized by the different net uh, institutions, such as uh, Nanets and also uh, Healing Nets is, um, Healing Net Foundation is putting together resources as for training purposes for uh, neuroendocrine specialists and even for those who might not consider themselves a neuroendocrine specialist per se, but wants to learn about specifically about, you know, some aspect of um, neuroendocrine treatment and care. And so I think, yeah, the answer is, is probably a little bit of both. The uh, knowledge is, is spreading. And as a result of that, there's more specialists that are available. Awesome. Awesome. So hello, everybody at home. We are just a little bit uh, past half the halfway point for today's hour, today's Luncheon with the Experts. And I just want to say if you're joining us or just joined us recently, my name is Rain Bennett. I'm your host. Today's guest is Dr. Eric Mitra. And uh, let us know where you are in the world. Uh, I see a lot of you have done that. And we love to we love to see how how far we're, we're reaching with this program. It really excites us and lets us know we're doing a good job. If you or someone that you know that would benefit from this video, uh, you know, can't stay for the whole time or, or wasn't able to join us for the live program, just know that it's going to live here on the Facebook page under the videos tabs. You can always come back to it. And if someone doesn't have Facebook, we also have it available uh, the following Monday. So in a few days uh, on the Carson Cancer Foundation's YouTube channel. And earlier today, we mentioned that uh, we have a new video series coming out of, of of treatment bit based videos that are coming from doctors like Dr. Mitra, which was part of that series. We released the first one two weeks ago. It is the ABCs of neuroendocrine tumors, a 2020 update. It's right here and getting lots of views on the Facebook page as well as the YouTube channel. And our next one on carcinoid syndrome and serotonin comes out tomorrow. Um, if you are enjoying the program today, uh, send in your questions, any questions that you have for Dr. Mitra. He's been gracious enough to give us his time today. Uh, even though he's been up working for hours, as he says, he, he still carves some time for us uh, in the morning over on the West Coast. And if we're doing a good job providing value, you can send us a little emoji, send us a little thumbs up, let us know it. Dr. Mitra told me before we got on that he really loves the heart emoji. So if he's doing a good job. Let's flood Facebook with those hearts. He just, he loves them. <laughs> Sorry. So let's, uh, we still got a lot of good questions. I love our numbers. Are, look, they're coming in. I see the hearts. I see the thumbs up. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Love All it. right. We got a question from Kathy. Kathy says, I had the Gallium 68 uh, Dota Tate uh, PET scan at, at OHSU, and I met, and my MET tumors lit up. I have inherited cancer caused by SDHB mutation. I'm unfamiliar with that acronym. Uh, my father died of par paraganglionomas. My tumors have been SD. Okay, this is a lot. I'm trying to get to the question. <laughs> if a tumor lights up on a dotate PET scan, couldn't PRT be an effective treatment for my tumors, even if they are sarcomas, although they secrete SSTRs? Did you, did you follow that? I got a little bit lost. I, th I, th I think so. I think I can answer it uh, sort of yeah. broadly because um, okay. that general question could kind of be applicable to lot, lots of different other types of cancers as well. Okay, good. Um, 
yeah, so thank you for that question. Uh, that's, this is another uh, great area of uh, research that's going on right now. So just to clarify, you know, currently in the United States, the only approval for um, PRT, again, is for gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that do express sufficient levels of somatostatin receptor that are seen on a gallium uh, dotatate PET scan. So just so we're all on the same page that that's really the limited um, uh, availability of it. However, you're absolutely right that many other types of cancers uh, also express somatostatin receptors. The easiest ones to understand would be other types of neuroendocrine tumor uh, that are not within the, the GEPNET category, such as things that come from the lungs or um, the thyroid or the kidneys, many other sources as the primary tumor. Um, there's indeed a lot of work that's been done already and it's ongoing on whether or not uh, the uh, use of PRRT and those indications are as good. Um, the initial information seems to be that it does work, but perhaps not as effectively. Then um, if you go even beyond that to other types of tumors completely, you mentioned sarcoma, but there could be other types of uh, tumors entirely. So there is expression of somatostatin receptors as well. We, um, our surgeon at OHSU, who's quite well known in the net community, Dr. Pommier, uh, has Absolutely. a st study that is uh, looking at neuroendocrine um, expression in uh, breast cancer. And uh, we are trying to get that study um, going right now to be able to uh, enroll patients who have breast cancer and then treat them with PRT again if they express enough somatostatin receptors. So I would just caution that with those other types of cancers, there's even less data that's available. So while in theory, you're absolutely right that if it lights up on a dota -to PET scan, why would you not be able to treat it? Um, but the, you know, we try to base all our treatment decisions based on evidence evidence and uh, there isn't a lot of evidence yet. So when you try to do a risk benefit analysis, um, we have to kind of consider that. The other thing that I'll just throw out there, of course, is insurance approval. We can't, it's a very costly therapy, uh, unfortunately. And so uh, we have to be very careful so that, you know, you don't end up with the, the bill. Um, and so pre-authorization, even for those other types of neuroendocrine tumors that I mentioned that are fall outside of the GEPNEC category can sometimes be challenging, and that is quite variable depending on the region of the country you're in. Mm -hmm. um, but if it goes be beyond even those, um, it would be very challenging, I think, to get it approved. Got it, got it. Thank you so much, and thank you for your yeah. question. Um, hope that helps. Also, I wanted to send a shout out to Dr. Rodney Pommier, who uh, Dr. Mitra just mentioned. He is in our video series as well, including the video that just dropped a couple of weeks ago, the 2020 update. So uh, such a great person and does a really good job of explaining complex issues in ways that people like me uh, can understand. So <laughs> special shout out to Dr. Yeah. Pommier. And uh, yeah. then also special shout out to David from Cherryville, North Carolina, just because I'm from North Carolina too. So what's up, David? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Durham, by the way, in the center part of the state. Um, okay, here's an interesting question from Susan, uh, again, about the Gallium 68 scan. One of the one area of concern, Susan says, of the Gallium 68 scans is the lighting up of the ovary due to estrogen or lighting up of liver due to normal seroton serotonin receptors. How do you st distinguish, excuse me, between physiologic uptake versus actual tumor in different parts of the body? Yeah, um, so I think the, the main answer to that is, of course, that's where all our years of training um, come into play, knowing what is normal physiologic uptake and what the distribution of that can be is something that is part of our training and also is in um, several different publications about you know no, uh, unusual but normal areas of uptake, such as you just mentioned in the ovaries. Um, so that's really the main answer I would say is just being able to know. Having said that, uh, I will also say that it's not always easy, even with uh, knowing that experience. Uh, sometimes it can be very confusing to know and we do equivocate, which is the um, worst thing we realize that we can do on a, on a scan, uh, but sometimes we just can't tell. And so, so we say that and then that can get followed up by other types of imaging to help really 
uh, know what it is. If multiple types of scans um, will show that things are normal, then we just attribute that uptake to something that's, that's also normal. But sometimes we do find uh, unusual areas of uptake which are actually abnormal. So. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Um, to everybody at home, I just want to say that um, uh, we're getting a, a lot of comments, Dr. Mitra. And so again, if we don't get to your question, you can follow up with the Carson and Cancer Foundation, send them a direct message. But we, I just wanted to say something I'm noticing as I scroll through the comments, uh, you know, apropos of our, our, our mentioning of the community uh, earlier in the, in the episode is I see people replying to each other and sharing their experience within the comments. And it's like, I, I just love that. Like that, that, yeah. is, that is the community, right? Is we're helping each other. We're sharing our, our, our stories with one another. And here at CCF, we're going to try to do the same thing, but that part is so great. I see people replying to questions that have popped up and, and I just wanted to take a moment to tip my hat to that because that, that is an illustration of the community of which we've discussed already. So Bravo to, to you all at home. And Dr. Mitra, just want to let you know that, that we just now stopped having that flood of hearts coming in. So <laughs> something great, my friend. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, okay. So I have a question. This interests me because I'm not familiar with it from Azad that says, does IV hydration or does IV hydration helpful? So I guess is IV hydration helpful before and after radiation? What is that? And, and then what's the answer to that? IV hydration is uh, just intravenous hydration, okay. so uh, typically, oh, okay. typically like nor no, just normal okay. saline. It's spelled yeah. IVY. That threw me off. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't the acronym. Yeah. <laughs> My yeah. bad. Got it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, it, is, uh, it is important, um, but when it comes to PRT specifically, it is um, not critical, I wouldn't say. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is because we are giving a lot of hydration through the amino acids that need to be given for kidney protection. In, in any case, you get a, a large volume of uh, fluids that way, so we don't need to give additional uh, hydration typically, but we do recommend that um, after finishing PRT that you continue uh, oral hydration just by mouth, drinking lots of water mm -hmm. over the next several days as well to, to help with that. Um, for other types of radiation treatments though, um, for instance, there's a, uh, another approval for um, MIBG therapy for patients with uh, pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. The, the brand name there is Acedra. That's not available in very, very many institutions uh, at all. We do do it at OHSU, and we do give IV hydration uh, during that, that course of that treatment because um, it's many days, and it's very hard to hydrate just by mouth during that time. Sure, sure. Understood. All right, thanks. That was good. Uh, thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> um, so Helen says, what's, what is the status of the amino acid infusion used for PRRT? So oh, it has improved greatly over, uh, since the time that PRT was approved the, at the time of the Netter 1 uh, phase 3 trial. The currently available amino acids were not available, and those prior ones unfortunately caused a lot of nausea, um, which all those patients had to suffer through, uh, unfortunately. But since then, uh, we have the uh, commercial approval of several newer agents, which are much better tolerated. In fact, most people have very minimal to no nausea. It, it, it amazes me having um, gone through the Netter One study and seeing all those seeing all those patients suffer uh, so greatly with nausea that now many of my patients, in fact, most of them, will eat during the course of the therapy, which is just amazing to me. But wonderful that that's where we've advanced to. I would. My understanding is that most uh, institutions that are giving PRT nowadays is are using the the new formulations. So, it, but that's a good thing to check um, before you get it done. Uh, certainly, it's a night and day difference between the two. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. Lots of questions today. People are interested in this. So um, I've got a couple of questions from Darren. So I definitely want to want to get to, to Darren. First one, he says, when carcinoid tumors can be removed and then you are treated with sandostatin, um, are your results, are your results good? Carcinoid tumors can be removed and then you are treated with sandostatin, LAR, depot. Are your results good? I guess, can, can the results be good? 
Well, I guess one way to um, think about that question is, it, you know, what is the, really the benefit of removing the primary tumor? Mm -hmm. And that's especially important for people who um, already have disease elsewhere. Uh, actually, back to Dr. Pamier, he's uh, one of the big proponents and has published uh, research uh, showing that, in fact, if you do remove the primary tumor, even in, if you have metastatic disease elsewhere, then the outcomes are better than if you don't. I will caution that there is uh, some controversy in that within the field, but I think that what's, probably most... What's the controversy? Well, in, in general, in, in cancer, um, when a patient has met metastatic disease elsewhere, removing the primary, this is for other types of cancer, are, is generally not done because you just assume it's gone everywhere um, within the body to have been able to circulate to those areas. And so what would be the benefit? Uh, but neuroendocrine, you know, is different in, in many different ways. Yeah. And I think this is potentially w one of the things that is different as well. So maybe I think that's what the question is getting at, is if you do remove it and then go on to standard treatment with sandostatin or, um, uh, yeah, sandostatin, then you could have better outcomes potentially. Yeah, see, that right there is an example of why it's so important to continue to educate and offer these programs, uh, uh, educate people about this disease, because if it was a, you know, a doctor who was unfamiliar, they may make that assumption of that it's not the right path to go. So, I mean, everyone right. at home, like this is, these things are exactly why we, we put out these programs and continue to educate people about this, this rare disease, because it's completely different and the approach is different. So um, that's a good, that's yeah. a good example of that. Okay, we've got about just shy of 10 minutes left, everybody. We see people from all over the world. I'm loving seeing this. Dr. Mitra, how, how's your time going? We really appreciate you. You've been giving some great answers. You doing okay over there? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, how, I'm here. How's, how's, the, uh, how's the rest of your day looking today? You, you slammed? Unfortunately so, yeah. <laughs> Today's one of those academic days with one meeting after the other, but oh, those are the best. We'll get, days. We'll get through it, <laughs> <laughs> dude. Yeah, it's so. These bad. are the days I get nothing but, done, but <laughs> I know, man. And and it seems like with everybody on Zoom calls, um, those days are coming more often. You know, just yeah. meeting after meeting after meeting. I, uh, I, you know, I'm I'm in a you know I'm an artist. I'm a filmmaker, so my world's a little bit different. But my wife is in the corporate space and you know, I've just noticed that things when you're in the office that would typically be like, I'm walking or, you know, someone's walking past your desk and like, Hey, Maya, like quick question. Right. Now those have to be meetings. And so right. I just see her getting bombarded with meetings all day long. And I'm like, whew, that is just, that's tough. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So this is, this is uh, my break for the day. This right. is great. This is the highlight of your day. Yeah. <laughs> Mine yeah. as well. And hopefully for those uh, at home. Um, this, this is a, okay. we got a question from AG. AG says, do you have any encouragement for net patients who would, who would qualify for PRRT except for the risks due to existing chronic kidney disease? Okay. Another, wow. So great. So many good questions today. Yeah. yeah this totally. is, you're really hitting, hitting a lot of the highlights. So kid, kidney disease, um, and PRRT is another area that I think, uh, deserve some education among the net community um, because what, what we're finding is that actually, again, going back to the use of the amino acids, really doesn't cause any additional radiation damage to the kidneys that we know of. So while the guidelines say that you know, the kidney function has to be at a certain level and we do try to generally follow those guidelines as much as possible, what we are finding more and more is that actually you can have severely reduced kidney function and still continue to get PRT and it's not going to cause any further reduction. That would be the, that would be the risk of it. Um, in fact, uh, several institutions I know around the country uh, treat patients with, with significantly reduced kidney function. And then um, lastly on that point is that even if you have essentially no kidney function and are on dialysis, then even then uh, that can be uh, handled with PRT. Definitely requires someone with experience to, to do that, um, but it has been done uh, around the world. So um, I don't think that should be a complete limit, limitation to PRT. Awesome, thanks for that. Uh, just saw that a friend of CCF joined today, Dr. Robert Ramirez. Just want to give a special shout out. Hello, doctor. Uh, Hi, uh, he's going to be on this, uh, this show too. So maybe he's, um, 
Maybe he's taking notes. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ramirez, uh, by the way, I need to, uh, to send you an email, so I'll, I'll be in touch soon. Uh, just a few more minutes with Dr. Mitra. This is the highlight of his day and mine and hopefully yours. <laughs> um, okay, question from Jessica. Top fan Jessica. Uh, regarding the gallium scan, can the test be messed up by the interval between injections and scan being too short or too long? Uh, so the normal wait time between the injection and the scan is uh, approximately 60 minutes. I would say that if you have a slight variation on that, even up to probably 15 minutes or, or, or so, I don't think it's going to really make a big difference at all. It's a very sensitive scan. Um, but if the deviation is much larger than that, then um, the main concern would probably be in terms of um, the follow-up. So the, um, the, we follow this value called uh, SUV or standardized uptake, uptake value, um, which on a dotatate scan is actually not well characterized yet, but we're learning. Uh, but if you have a prior PET scan and a follow-up scan and, the, and that uptake period that you just mentioned is widely different, then probably the SUV values it would not be very reliable. But just in terms of uh, vi visually, I think we have a little bit of uh, freedom there. Got it, got it. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Ramirez said hello back to us. Um, so Christine says, do I have to manage my healthcare treatments if I can't travel to net specialists for PRRT? I entirely understand. Yeah, I'm question. guessing. Um, if she can't travel to a net specialist for PRT, um, maybe the question is, how do I manage my healthcare treatments? Um, Christine, if you're still around, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, maybe hit us back and, and, and clarify your question a little bit. We'd love to be able to, to, to help out. Um, okay, so I have a, another question from Cheryl. It says, would PRT be safe for someone with type 1 diabetes for 40 years uh, and their for renal function is at risk? Yeah, um, we def diabetes by itself is not a contraindication to PRT, and as I mentioned, the with the use of the amino acids, we're not really seeing any kidney damage. So even if you do have are at risk uh, for kidney damage for other medical conditions such as diabetes, or already have it, um, I don't think it should be a, a major major factor. I think that. Hard part is those who have significant kidney damage already, but are not on dialysis. Um, though th that's a, a very high risk group, and we might want to be careful with that. But generally speaking, we're not really, see which is great. Um, actually, also not. I would mention on that note, not seeing much liver toxicity either. Really, the main concern for PRT is to bone marrow toxicity and primarily to uh, platelets, which are, of course, what um, help caught your blood. The, that's the main thing that we're seeing. Got it. Got it. Okay. We have a question. Just a few more minutes. A uh, question from Peggy who says, I have peanuts. I just finished with my last PR treatment on April 30th and my tumor shrunk. So that's good news. Uh, do, you know, can we expect them to, to continue to shrink more over time or, or typically is, is the amount they have shrunk all, all they're going to? Yeah. Um, so again, the fact that they actually have shrunk is already uh, a wonderful thing because we're not necessarily expecting that with PRT. What we're really aiming for is that the disease just stays under con control and doesn't continue to grow. Um, if it has shrunk and you have had that great uh, benefit from it, it, then it's reasonable to expect that the uh, radiation can have some continued effect over, over several months, at least many months. Um, eventually, most likely, uh, the radiation levels will, once they drop off, then the tumor will potentially start to grow again. It's hard to know, of course. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great outcome, and, and that's ideally what we like to look for. Awesome. Awesome to hear. Doc, Dr. Mitra, I just got to say thank you so much again uh, for your time today. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question before we go um, that I like to ask everybody. Um, what, what, if anything, has you uh, hopeful for, you know, this community that we've talked about today, this, this neuroendocrine cancer community? What, are there anything coming, coming down the, the pike that are, you're excited about? Or what is anything that we have to look forward to? I know that 
I've seen us learn so much as a, as a community and, and society in the past 10 years. What do you think we have to look forward to in the next five to 10? I think just more of that, you know, as you, as we've talked about in several different ways, the community has continued to grow. Our education has uh, continued to grow. Our understanding of this disease has, has grown. I, I see absolutely no reason why that's going to change. So I think it's going to continue to exponentially grow over time. There's good, there's so much work on novel therapies that are coming down the pipeline, our understanding of surgery and uh, diagnostic tests, uh, such as the NET test and others um, are evolving. So it's, it's one of those things where it's just going to, going to continue to build on itself. And since the community is already so strong, I think it's only going to get stronger. And so I'm very excited to, to be uh, continuing to be part of this for the next five to 10 years and, and probably longer. So awesome. thank you, uh, Rain, very much. And, and, and I also want to thank everyone who joined in from around the world. Is, uh, thank you for sharing your time with me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you as well. Thanks to those at home. Thanks to our presenting sponsor, Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. We couldn't do this without their support. And we hope you all join us next week, next Thursday, for our next episode of Luncheon with the Experts. Bye-bye, everybody. Stay healthy. Stay safe.